in a world where Microsoft virtualization is still considered to be the underdog by some. The Hyper-V Amigos enlighten the IT crowds on how they could very well be mistaken. Hello Didier, how are you doing my friend? Hello Carsten, I'm doing just fine. Uh, the, the end of the year is nearing and I'm looking forward to some time off. But before we do that, let's dive into the lab again. Uh, yeah, and my friend, you are very fast. It has to be the height you are now in. It's, the background is unusual for your room, so it's, it looks a little bit different. <laughs> yes, that's true. I am, uh, I'm, as they call it, uh, remotely working from uh, a friendly office. <laughs> that's true. And it has the same color than my background has. That's so cool. Yes, for some okay. reason. So Didier, um, we want. Last time our showcast was about um, backing up an S2D cluster to a single node with storage spaces, and I think it was quite successful, quite nice. And we we said we will do also a showcast where we will show how we back up uh, S2D or something else to a high available. Um, storage system to a scale-out file server on i studio that's the topic of our show today um, and we did the show once already but uh, it didn't turn out so well so we had some problems with the recording so we do it again today uh, and it's just some days to christmas now, so um, let's start with that okay okay yeah so we are here at it's other hardware that we had last time. So this time it's a Tarox setup. Tarox is, for, for all of you who doesn't know Tarox, uh, it's a German-based uh, OE, uh, Intel OEM. So we have some nice Intel servers here with some nice hardware in it. And in fact, this system is a two-node S2D cluster running with op Intel Obtain DIMMs, half a terabyte each. And then uh, each machine has 16 Intel SSDs, two terabyte SSDs. And, and yes, we know the cache to uh, capacity ratio is quite incorrect here, uh, but we just wanted to, to test the Obtain, the Obtain stuff. And uh, we have deployed 20 VM fleet VMs to every node. You see that here. And the VM fleet VMs have, have not a 10 gigabyte test file, we created an 80 gigabyte test file. So we have something to back up, right? Yeah. So, and uh, the machines have networking wise, we have two SMB networks that are two 100 gig NICs, but unfortunately the Tarox systems have only X8 slots, so we can only use roughly 50 gigabit instead of 200. Our cards would be capable of 200 um, gigabit, uh, but that doesn't matter. 50 is also not too bad. Um, we call that first world problem. Really, it is a full, first world problem. <laughs> and all the VMware guys yeah. are now thinking, huh, 50 gigabit, was it, what are they talking about? <laughs> okay, that, okay, that was me. Okay. So, um, so um, this is our network. And maybe you and talk maybe a little bit about our backup target, right? Okay, so we have the two node cluster, which is our source where the uh, Hyper VVMs are running on a hyper converged infrastructure. We are going to back them up to a highly available backup target. So, how do we do that? Well, we created a two node uh, S2D cluster, but instead of running uh, VMs on there, we created uh, two soft disks, uh, two disks, and on those disks, we've created uh, shares for our SOFS role. So here is our SOFS role, Tarox SOFS. It has, as you can see, two shares. Uh, one is at the moment owned by the node, the node 3 and the other one is no, owned by node 4. But that's how we balance the load. So every server has something to do or contribute to the backups. And that's basically it. Now, the nice thing about it is, of course, that we want to back up from the hyper share. So what does that mean? Share means SMB3. SMB3 means uh, RDMA. 
So that's what we're going to do. We are going to leverage RDMA here as well to reduce the CPU, to offload the CPU uh, uh, cycles to the NICs. So that's uh, saving on that. And what we also have is uh, we are leveraging our SMB networks we have anyway for the CSV traffic and the uh, S2D traffic. So we take them and we make a, a small tweak, of course, if we go to properties, that's, oh, that's working. We make sure they allow clients to connect to this network because Veeam is not uh, a part of the cluster. So you have to allow clients to connect to it. Uh, so that's why we do that. So we do that for both networks. Now, uh, when you use SMB, to a file share, you have also multi-channel. So the beauty of this is that actually the network is also fully redundant and is leveraged at the same time. So both network pipes normally are used with this setup. If you would be backing up to, uh, let's say, a, a local disk on a, on, a, on a server, then you do not leverage multi-channel because it's not SMB. It's just TCP IP moving the data to that backup type. But in this case, we can leverage it. And now we've been talking about backup. So next to our backup target, we also need a backup uh, server, backup software. And for that, we are going to use Veeam. And as Veeam was so nice to release uh, a test version of V10 uh, yesterday morning, yes. I think it was. We had to uh, reinstall so had everything, right? Yeah. So we had V10 running in beta two. Now this number that will tell you it's RC release candidate one. So it's been reinstalled, and as it's testing software, there's no in-place upgrade at this moment, so we had to start from start again, but okay, we like to do that. What well, we did it, so what we have here at the moment is, uh, let's go over it, we have the backup infrastructure, so what we added the Tarox cluster with our Hyper-V VMs running there to the managed server. We also created uh, some backup repositories, and those backup repositories are pointing to the two soft shares we made. So it's an SMB3 share that we are using. As you can see, this is the, the path to the share. So we have two of them. And then we also created, of course, backup jobs. Backup jobs. We have backup from VMs from node one to node three from the from the backup to target. The and we have, yeah, to the share. Yeah, and we have uh, back, uh, backups from node two from the source to node four, that's on the target. And that's a file share, of course, because that's what we're doing. We can show you that quite quickly. Yeah, but maybe this is a maybe bit confuse, confuse, uh, confusing because uh, we named the shares on the CSVs like the host, and this is on a requirement for VM feed. So you're actually backing up the CSV with a lot of VMs. Uh, to a share on one node and uh, the other CSV to the uh, CSV on the, or the share on the other node, right? Okay. And we are using uh, VMs created by VM fleet, so we're not using application aware uh, backups for this. This is just crash consistent. But anyway, it provides for a nice test bed to play around with. Maybe one thing you notice, uh, Veeam by default will uh, limit your parallel uh, processing to four instances. Well, you can tweak that. The trick is not to tweak it too much. Uh, make sure your hardware can handle it, your infrastructure can handle it. Uh, and we did that, so we, we made sure we can have six concurrent uh, tasks running, and we'll play with that. And you, and you can, let's say, tweak it in your environments to see what works best for you. Take it easy, take it slow, and you'll see what, what, uh, what works best for you. Don't jump from four to 50, that's not gonna work. So we've got this set up, and we would like to show you yes, a couple of so things. So kick off a backup, right? Let's kick off a backup. It's active full, so we have lots of data. Here we go. So we actually have deployed 20 VM fleet VMs with uh, 100 gig disk, but we only back up 10 of them because we don't want to wait yes. too long to finish the backup, right? Yeah. It's kind of boring watching a, a percentage creep up, yeah. you know. So, so and uh, while this is starting, you maybe can uh, talk a bit about the setup on the target. It's also a bit unusual because we don't have spinning disks here. 
No, if we look at the tiger, we, we actually used NVMe yeah. disk for that, which is kind of nice because we want to make sure the source is not uh, a congestion point. Now, often if you play with backups, you'll notice that uh, most of the time the source is the, is the bottleneck. But you have to remember that a backup target normally in large environments will be used by multiple source uh, target, uh, sources. So this means that your target will be hit from many to yeah. one, so to speak. And if that target is then, let's say, uh, at the top of its performance, you will have to add extra targets to, to scale out. But uh, don't think that your target can be, let's say, the least performant machine. If you have multiple sources going to that single target, you might want to invest in that yeah. as well, especially in terms of cores, because uh, a task for Veeam is assigned to a core. So if you want to run multiple uh, tasks, concurrent tasks, you will need multiple cores, and you have to balance a bit between the number of servers versus the cores in the servers. But we're not going to turn this into a Veeam sizing uh, exercise. But uh, it's just to say that many people can get away with HDDs and their backup targets, especially if you have multiple of them. That's just fine. In some environments, you might want to go to SSD, and in some environments, you might want to leverage NVMEs. Uh, one of the beautiful things of using storage spaces as a backup target is that you can use the multi-resilient volume if you want. So then you can actually have uh, best of the both worlds. You can have your NVMEs to ingest all the, all the traffic at high speed from multiple sources, but your capacity comes from more affordable storage. So, but in the end, nowadays, uh, I see more and more flash being used even for backup targets. Uh, the market is slowly but surely drifting that way. Uh, and also remember that the economies of scale that some hyperscalers have do not always transport on your internal environment one to one. Right? Uh, saving five dollars per server is enormously important if you have two million servers because that's real money. But if you only have ten servers, that five dollars translates into fifty euro savings, and that doesn't really buy you that much in in, uh, in capital. But look, the backup is running. Let's have a look at the, at the performance at the moment. It's at 2.5 gigabytes. Uh, if we open it, <coughs> you will see that we have six VMs running at the same time. And that's uh, because I limited the, uh, the on-host proxy to six concurrent tasks, just to make sure that we weren't overdoing it. Because we, want, we might want to do something else. We might want to start a second job. So then there are more concurrent tasks going to the, the backup target, so that's what we're playing with. <laughs> what we can also do is, as mentioned, SOFS is high available storage, and it's continuously available, which means that we could actually now reboot the, uh, the target node. You will see a short stall in throughput, but the backup should survive this perfectly. So this is the reason why we're showing this. If you are providing backup targets for multiple business units or you're, or you're a service provider, you might have a need for high available or continuous available backup targets. So maybe my friend wants to do the honors. Do you want to? First kick off another, another uh, backup and then and I will connect to the yeah? okay. um, BMC and we will not gracefully will not. shut it down. We will reset it, right? Okay. Because it's Fair really, uh, if you, Shut down a node. That's nice. Yeah. But uh, what happened if you yeah. really kill one? Yeah, yeah. We we'll we'll show you the beauty of uh, continuous availability in SMB3 in, a, in all its glory. Right? In in the worst possible conditions, a blue screen, a power loss, or whatever. Don't mention so blue screen here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> That was unintended. <laughs> yeah, we have a little bit story behind that because I had some problems with my recording device here, and I hope we will not have it again. Um, it did a blue screen uh, while we were recording the session, and that's unfortunate. So let me just connect to the BMC of the second uh, server. Okay. So I will type my password here, and then I will move it to the recording. So the second server, you mean S2D4, yes. right? Yes. So before you before you reset it, uh, let the the data movement begin. So then we really see its beauty. So let me just see where we can reboot the server. Where is the power? 
power control server of left course stop. here is it power control there we go. so it's, i'm just preparing we will do uh, so wait wait for it i will not do no. it yet this is a okay. force reset server we are prepared now we can yeah let's look at the backup so so okay it's initializing it's six concurrent uh, tasks so six vms because they all have one disk point to note if you have a vm with six disks six concurrent tasks would be those six disks of that one vm so it doesn't concurrent tasks don't always translate one to one with vms so just so you know that uh, as it's s2d we are using the uh, host itself as a proxy so we don't have off host proxies in this scenario we're not leveraging vss not software not hardware vss it's not available in this uh, use case but that's okay because we have windows server 2019 and a modern version of theme so we can leverage the uh, new checkpoints we have now for backups the recovery checkpoints and that's what's happening now it's starting now it's starting and it's always nice to see the throughput when you do them side by side so let's have a look here yeah, once in a while we have an issue with a VM. We probably we think it might be related in this uh, moment to the. Please, Canada. Uh, we don't have that with. We're not. We're not, we're not sure. It's not, it, it's not that important. So we are demoing the the failover here. Yeah. So you have, have two point three here. Maybe we can do this. Yeah. We have two point three here, and we can open this. No, it will always change to the active one. Sorry. Yeah. So it's two. It's two point six. So. We are, we're getting nice throughput and of course this one has a little dip because of course uh, one failed and now it needs to kick off the others but it's going to pick up yeah. again yeah. as these start working so if you have multiple parallel jobs running uh, and you have uh, different sized vms they won't all finish at the same time because these vms are very equal so they tend to start at the same time and finish yeah. at the same time but if you have different sized VMs, they will be spread out a bit more, and that pipeline will be filled more, more, more free, no more, let's say, evenly. So you won't have these big mountains here with this big valley of doing nothing while the other VMs are kicking off. It will be a bit yeah. more moderated. But we're getting 2.5, which is nice, and we're getting 2.7 here. So I would say this is not too shabby for. A, for a backup system it's actually it is uh, four point something uh, f nearly five giga gigabyte right yeah it's nice it's nice so it's let's nice. uh kick off yeah. and then we afterwards when it's up again we will uh, explain a little bit more about the setup right so let me see yeah. here yeah. is my perform action yes okay cool this is uh, the moment of truth so and we should should look at the cluster for a short period if the node is gone soon yes let's just start some PowerShell here so let's do a get cluster node right yes. takes a while now it's down you see here it's down it's down here okay yes. and we go back to now, Veeam let's go to the backup. back to Veeam so Veeam is now probably having a bit of a moment there, like, hey, what's happening? It's still doing 700 uh, megabytes. But it's now thinking about what's happening because it's, there's a little transition phase where the I.O. is queued, but then it will pick up again. And your backups will not fail. I think it's so running. This is huh? possibly the worst. Yeah, so, yeah but, but it will pick up ah, again. Right? I mean, 3.1 so gigabytes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there we go. That's it. So you survived a server crash basically without your backups giving you one hit. So the other backup, please. The other backups. These farms are modal, so we need to close them. Yeah. And this one is going strong as well. So we are over five gigs at the moment. So this is nice. It's really nice. So if we look at the cluster, if the surviving node, we see that uh, the one node is down, and this node has everything. It has all the disks are presented disks. here. Our role is, of yeah, course, role running is. here, our soft server. And it also has, it has the host has server, the, host the master of the class. So this is, oh, really, this is really redundant, right? Redundant, right? Yes. It's a very nice 
It's a very like nice it. setup. I like it. Yeah. Uh, you can actually also build this with a general purpose file server, but general purpose file server is not supported on S2D. So if you use S2D, uh, you shouldn't do that on, until it is supported. Maybe that will happen, maybe that won't happen, I don't know. Uh, but if you want to do this with physical hardware, you can use iSCSI or, or FC or any type of shared storage, uh, which you can leverage to build a cluster with a general purpose file server. Uh, you will also have load balancing because those shares can be balanced out across the nodes. And it's pretty much the same uh, behavior, only the dip is a little bit longer. But that, that's about it. So uh, this doesn't per se require S2D, you can build this on uh, uh, or REFS even. So all these goodies are available to a lot of uh, Microsoft customers uh, in all their environments and their choices of hardware. But of course, S2D gives you price, price performance for a great value, I would say. And you also have the benefit that if you leverage REFS, that you have the, the block cloning for the metadata operations, which makes it faster. And if you run REFS on storage basis, you have, you enable uh, the, help me. Uh, I draw a blank. I mean, deduplication. <laughs> So you can enable the deduplication, but also the error chart. Ah, yeah, right? the, uh, uh, continuous, uh, it's called uh, the integrity streams for the data. The integrity streams, you turn it on, then you have an event log that there is a bit rot or a problem with, uh, with some storage, and then it will repair it automatically on the fly for you from the parity bits. So that's pretty nice. That storage system protects and repairs itself, and you only get that in the combo REFS and storage basis. Yeah. So now here we see the last job is, is doing it. It, it. This job doesn't have an error. We saw an error in the other one. Um, yeah. So this time it's the other machine. <laughs> and this has to be, it has to be released candidate one uh, because with, uh, with uh, being version 9.5 update 4B, we, we didn't have that. Okay, so now okay, let's talk so a little bit about uh, the setup because we've shown the failover. You mentioned we use RDMA, so we maybe uh, show how you configure that because it's a little bit tricky, right? Well, I don't find it tricky. You, but anymore, you know but what you know. to do. I don't find yes. S2D tricky at all, but I know what I do. So, so from the VAME side, uh, what you need to do is, I'm going to close this window here while this backup continues. You might not have 10 or 25 or whatever gigabit uh, connectivity to your Veeam server by default or to your uh, backup targets by default, but you can do that if you want, but you can also use preferred networks. Now, preferred networks is something that you can configure in the main menu. You go to traffic rules and you're not there yet, you go to networks, and there you can add preferred backup networks. And basically what we did is we added both the subnets of our SMB1 and SMB2 uh, networks we use for the clusters. Because S2D will use these networks for its storage uh, uh, synchronization, uh, also for replication, for CSV traffic, for whatever you push through it over SMB. But you can also leverage this for your backups if you but want. But as I you understand it correctly, this. this is not a must, but it will speed up the 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 process of RDMA usage. Well, if, if, well not the process of RDMA usage. It, it will it will speed up the uh, initialization of the backups if you also uh, connect your VBR server to those two networks, because otherwise it will try and try and fail. It will decide that it hasn't connectivity. It will still decide to use the preferred networks between the target and the source. But the initialization it has to do per VM takes four to five times as long as if they have it. And this just speeds up your entire backup job uh, initialization. So it's worthwhile doing. And actually, it's mentioned in the documentation. It's one line, but it's not explained why or how. And most people forget it. And if you forget it, you might think, hey, why is my backup initialization so slow? And if you dive into the logs of your backup, you will see the connectivity, the trying, the, 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 the timeouts, that it doesn't get a response on that network, which slows down the initialization because it does that for every VM. So to make your life easy, 
don't just add the subnets in the configuration here, but also add them actually to your Beam server, and we can show them to you here. There we go. So we also have connectivity to our VM on the same VLAN, on the same subnets as our target and source uh, servers. And that's what makes the initialization not slower if you use a preferred network. Now the great thing of a preferred network, it will be leveraged for backups, it will be leveraged for restores, and it will be leveraged for uh, instant recovery. So even that is fast, right? And that's another big benefit of having uh, uh, perform and backup storage, the NVMEs, you know, you might be laughing or thinking, oh, that's a lot of money. But if you want to do instant recovery, it helps because the moment your VM is live, all the new writes are going to the checkpoint, but all the data that's being read is coming from your backup storage. So that has to be able to keep up along with the network. So the better the network and the, be and, and the better the backup storage, the better your instant recovery experience will be. So that's something we can demonstrate as well. We can do an instant recovery from... Uh, yeah, but maybe first you show the RDMA user. Is it all we have to configure for RDMA? No. No, if you if you are going to use RDMA, we've already mentioned that for the, the Veeam backups to use those networks, we want to enable uh, client connectivity yeah. to yeah. the cluster networks, right? But we also, of course, have to configure uh, DCB on the hosts and on the switches. So. That is something that is mandatory if you use Rocky. If you are using IWARP, you don't need to do it. You can do it, but it's not a required, not a hard requirement, yeah. so to say. Now, the thing about Rocky is it works well, uh, but the switches have to have to be configured correctly. The hosts have to be configured correctly, and the the the, the truth is not all hardware is created equal. So there are NICs and switches that do it better and easier than others. So do your homework, do your research, and figure out which ones those are. I'm not gonna Why not? mention them. I don't know. You I can, can do it. I will do it. I prefer Melanoc cards because they have a very long experience with RDMA. Um, there are now choices if you want to do IWAP. The the only choice today that is available in Europe widely is. Uh, Mavel was called Cavium yeah. and Logic, but with these cards, uh, they they come pre-configured with Rocky V2, so don't only buy them yeah. and think you have IWAP yeah. cards. These cards can do everything. They can do Rocky, Rocky V2, and IWAP, and they are pre-configured for Rocky V2. So here applies everything that you have to do with Mellanox. Um, um, BFC configuration, the switches, uh, and everything. And you have to actively switch them to IWAP if you want to use IWAP. So yeah. I'm so far a big fan of Melanox, and I know you are too. Sure. Yeah. And uh, switch-wise, there are some good choices. Uh, Melanox switches are a great one. We have those. Dell switches are a great one if you can, if you can configure them. It's as easy as Melanox. Lenovo switches, I'm, I'm, they grow on me because you only have to use one commandlet. It's, it's yes. amazing. They are. They are very competitively priced, and they are very simple, and they work. They work, yeah. I mean, I mean, I think maybe, maybe those are the top three switches yeah. in the in the Rocky in the Rocky framework. Okay, so you only have uh, that's all you have to do. You you just configure RDMA in your environment that you have to do anyway if you want to use it, and then you turn this on in the in the backup server, but it's not mandatory, and you have to uh, open the backup target to use the SMB networks for client access. And that's everything yes. that uh, SMB and RDMA takes. Wow. To Insert, in certain environments, if you want to leverage, and it's not really just related to RDMA, but the preferred networks in some environments, depending on whether you're using SOFs or not, or if you're using uh, a traditional cluster with a traditional uh, backup target, sometimes, uh, for example, with uh, instant recovery, it will not pick up the, the uh, preferred network. And with a normal restore, it would. And that those are little tweaks you can do to Veeam, and they are quite, let's say, use case specific depending on the setup and the environment. So I'm not going to dive into that. I might do might do a blog post on it later, and we can discuss it in a future uh, uh, webcast. 
but it's it's let's say it's the, it's the fine the finer details sometimes that you need to do to make it work. Uh, in reality, I have always found Veeam support to be very uh, interested in uh, in helping out with such cases. Uh, I had that case. I really was struggling. I could see what was happening and why it was wrong. The only thing I couldn't figure out is how do I solve this. And what I actually did is, and this, maybe this is a tip if you have to deal with support, or if you've ever worked in support, you might appreciate it. I make videos. I, I clear the log files, I reproduce the problem, and I make a video. So I can show them this is in this situation, this is in the other situation, this is working, this is not working. So they have the time, they have the logs, they can actually put the logs next to the video and see yeah. exactly what you're doing. And to help people help you, that is such a benefit that I actually highly advise you, if you have a complex problem, uh, it can be very difficult to type it all out in an email or a support call. Just be concise in that support call, send them a video as an attachment or upload it on the website and they'll be very much better positioned to help you fix the issue. Okay, I see we have only 31 minutes and that's very short for a showcast that we do. So maybe you show an instant recovery. We have just time for an instant recovery, man. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna do an instant recovery from this one because I know all these were successful. So we have a backup. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to home, for example. Are you driving? Or no, you are driving. driving. I, I did nothing. Okay. So okay, you got I the saw. wrong menu. <laughs> so restore Hyper-V. So what are we doing here? We start from backup. Restore the entire VM. We are going to use instant VM recovery. Now we have to look for a machine. So what were the names? Hyper-V or VM no, something? I'll, find, I'll find one from backup. Okay, so we go to this backup. Then we say we'll take this one, the first one we find. Next, <laughs> we will we will restore to the original location. So in the end, at the end of the instant recovery, it will be uh, just overwriting the one that's running now. So it's going to destroy the running VM. This action basically. I do not want to scan it for hardware, but Veeam has the tools to make sure if you restore yeah, a VM yeah. and you, you think it went down due to some malware, uh, you can scan it for that. You can also run scripts, check it for uh, GDPR compliance, whatever you want to do. You can give it a reason. Well, this is a demo, right? Let's type it in just to show you can. Next. So it's warning you that that VM still exists and is uh, actually okay. So are you going to destroy it? Yeah. Yes, we are. That's what we want. So we click finish and then the instant recovery starts. Now what is happening is actually uh, we are going to map this uh, VM to a target host and it will be, uh, it will get a checkpoint and that checkpoint will become, at that moment the VM will become active. It will be available for your users, even if it hasn't been moved to its original location and clustered again. Right. So if you if you want to take a yeah, look at take a look. Power Access to D2, normally, or you can also look at Power Access to D1. Actually, we have we have it open here. Uh, it is a two dash sixty. To go down. So two that is still running. So it's gone. No, it's gone. So it's gone. That's normal. It's be, it's been wiped. You can so it's going to the Hyper-V manager, right? Yeah. It's being wiped. It's going to be higher available again. So what we see here, it's restored the configuration. It's uh, uh, created a snapshot. So now that VM is available, so you can ping it actually, or you can you can you can connect to it via the console. So let's do let's try so that. I do that. Could you help me there? Oh, you can do it. You have your password, or should I do it? I uh, do it. It's a German keyboard. I'm not doing so well on these things. <laughs> Let's see if I do well. <laughs> okay. I didn't, right? Oh, yeah. I, I used the wrong password. Here we are. So you see, Just it starting, is available. Yeah. yeah. So it is available. So, but in, that's instant recovery. But of course, the thing, uh, it doesn't stop there. What you can see here is that it will tell you it's ready to be 
moved to the uh, production environment. So it's waiting for your action. So you can actually very quickly restore multiple VMs this way, have them available for your users. And while the users are already happy working again, you can say, okay, it's time to you know, move on and uh, migrate them to production. But of so that's course what you need a fast now. start, because it's just doing a checkpoint on the source system and yes. uh, the data is mounted from the backup, right? So if you have a very yeah. a, a slow backup system, you can yeah. do one, and not if, 20. And if you have one gigabit networking or so, this is not yeah. going to be a mass uh, the migration. Uh, yeah, a mass migration or something, and you have, you have to. But again, tricks you can do. Uh, I'm going to migrate it to production to take that off. But tricks you can do is, uh, I, I have in the past installed a lot of cheap and uh, consumer level NVMEs in, in in some of the cluster hosts, and I can do the instant recovery uh, to those VMs uh, to those uh, disks. Uh, the writes are pretty good because it writes to the to the checkpoint. Yeah. The reads are pretty good if you have a decent uh, backup target. Uh, and then, when they are running, you move them to production. But the people don't notice that. That's behind the scenes for them. They're already working. But there are, but that prevents that you would have to restore 10 VMs to let's say uh, lesser capable storage and create a performance problem. So those are all kinds kinds of little tricks you can do. Because you have your 10 VMs already uh, available to instant recovery, but the move to production you do one by one or two by two, and et cetera, et cetera. So you can play in with that. Depending on your environment, this is nice. Yeah. Now, we've had discussions with people, uh, should we invest in that? Well, the question is always, how fast do you need to be back up and running? Uh, in these days of ransomware, uh, it might be wise to invest in some, uh, let's say, ca capability to restore a lot of VMs quite fast, right? Uh, because just calculate it, if you have 300 VMs to restore and they have all been impacted by ransomware, uh, you might want to have a bit of an infrastructure that can handle that. So now it's restoring the VM. It will maybe, take maybe you want to look Maybe you want to look at the RDMA traffic yeah, from we can the do that. source. Yeah. So we were starting, so this is the source. Uh, do we have our RDMA? Counter prepared here somewhere. Yeah, go on the first one. I think I all the disks are on the first one. No. Oh. Ah, yeah, because we failed over. Let's let's take a look. To be. No, it's on the second one. That's okay. It's on the second one. That's okay. We can just copy. I think. There we go. We can copy this one. They're exactly the same name, so we can just put it on here. because it's quite interesting. While this is happening, let's go here. These are our RDMA NICs. And if you look at the NICs on the host, <coughs> you won't see much because the rocky traffic isn't shown in the, uh, in the normal NICs, right? That's right. So which one are they? And we go to the target. Oh, we rebooted four. Let's see where uh, where our where our disk is living at the moment. All at third. But you can move it. Yeah, it's okay. But we can we can just look here. Yeah. It's being restored from this node. So we have an RDMA counter here as well. Not not much RMA. No, no, it's it's four. It's four, it's four right? Open four. But open four. Four. four no, you have four, to uh, double click on the side. Should I do yeah. it? Well, going there. But maybe we're too slow. Maybe maybe it's already done by now. Let me do it. No, yeah, yeah, you do it. It's a German clicker. No, yeah. <laughs> Nothing to do with a German clicker, my friend. <laughs> so here we are. There was an unplanned reboot. Yes. Uh, how did that happen? Right. I don't know. Somebody... So, <laughs> so what do you want to to show? The RMA. Oh, oh just just go to the RMA traffic. There's a there's a counter there already. Oh, it's already there. That's good prepared. But we don't have much RMA here. There's not much happening here. Let's look at the Nick. 
mix. Yeah, but I, I, I think we might be too slow for green, maybe. It's already four minutes. I think it's it's almost finalizing this. I think it takes about five minutes. Yeah, but it says 9% restored, 10% restored. Does it? Oh, then it's going slow. Then we have another issue, I think. This is way too slow. Well, maybe we're going over the wrong neck. That would be nice. Then we can troubleshoot that. So where is the restore happening of the machine? We have to look in the... Well, it is going It is going to node two, right? It's going back to the original location. So it's on disk two. And disk two at the moment is running on... No, you oh, are on, you're on, on the file server. server. You are on, don't get confused. You're not oh, on the Hyper-V yeah. server. <laughs> but it's re this is why we do it with two persons. So. <laughs> it's being restored from here. Yes. It's being restored from here. Yes. It's, it's going here. And now we have some traffic. So I guess. Yeah. So maybe we look in the cluster if it's already there. It's clustered. Mm, probably not. Or do we have the cluster open? So the VM fleet is stopped, so we don't see the traffic from the VM fleet there. It's not there yet. You can also take a peek, of course, in Hyper-V Manager. No, it's on the second one, right? 16 is here. there. You should see a checkpoint if you open the checkpoint window. Huh? Yeah, there it is. We have VM instant VM recovery. recovery. And once and once the data copying is done, it will uh, be active and be clustered for you. So it's all automated. You don't have to do that manually. That's cool. Uh, but it's taking a bit longer than I expected. I must say. It's, now it's no, keep uh, oh. it's going on. Yeah, thirty six percent, thirty seven. It's a 100 gigabyte file. Yeah, it is. And uh, the the storage migration it does for you is fail safe, right? Uh, even if that would fail, your VM would not be lost or, or dead. Uh, storage migrations normally are pretty pretty uh, resilient. And it's from a backup anyway. If it if it doesn't work, uh, you can try again. With a, with a different restore point from the same restore point. I actually have never seen this fail. If it fails, it just won't start because I misconfigured something or I'm not using the correct network or whatever. But the process itself is pretty reliable and, and, and rugged. Uh, and this is actually things we do uh, on a regular basis. So we do restores of VMs, we do instant recovery of VMs. And the reason we do that is that uh, we try to make sure that everybody in the team has some familiarity with the process because the moment you have to restore 20 VMs because you had some ransomware attack or whatever, or you had mm -hmm. some storage corruption, that's not the moment where you want to figure out how it works and maybe things were not configured as you expected and it's not going as well or as predictable as you want. So, so try this out in the good times so that you know what to do when the, the bad times come. That's true. That's the, the best of I, I think we have a previous restore maybe here somewhere. Uh, yeah, there. Yeah. This one. So how long did this one take? It was only seven minutes. Yeah. So maybe it's almost done. You know what they say, right? The hardest time is to write uh, progress counters in IT. <laughs> <laughs> but we have already... Uh, 16 minutes, no, uh, 12, 11 minutes here. So yeah, but wait, uh, yeah, but only only eight minutes of data copying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of course the time, the time that you started to restore, is what counts as the start. So, but anyway, that's instant recovery in action for you. So uh, let's maybe sum up what we did, and then maybe it's done, so we can show yep. the. Uh, the, the success of it. I, I'm pretty okay. sure it will it will work. Uh, and uh, mention again, 
We are working with Veeam V10, the long-awaited release uh, for years now, and uh, this is the release candidate one. So until two days ago, we had the better two. Uh, we both are Veeam Vanguard, so we have access to, to some of the stuff. And now I think the release candidate is open available, or yeah. it is? I think, I, I, I'm not sure about that, but maybe, maybe it is. Maybe it is. Know. Uh, I'm not sure about it. You see something else here. Uh, we have some, uh, um, how you call it, cloud storage integrated. But this is this is for another webinar. We have uh, yeah. not Am we have an S Amazon S3 uh, compatible cloud storage there. It's called Wasabi. Yeah. Very experimental. Yeah. Yeah. It's very yeah. interesting. You get a 30-day trial with a terabyte, and um, it has also the possibility to use. I always get the word, word wrong. It's immutable, immutable, immutable. storage, immutable. immutability. So, so the so the idea is that with with a scale out backup repository, we like to create it here. So we have uh, a server with some iSCSI storage as backup attached, but we also have a capacity here, and that's our cloud provider. Wasabi. Don't remove it. <laughs> I'm not removing it. I'm going to properties. So you have the performance here as set. That's our iSCSI local storage. Uh, then we have our replacement policy, which is for performance or for data locality. But then we added the capacity tier, which is the Wasabi tier. And then we can uh, do all kinds of new funky stuff in uh, V10. Uh, the move and the copy, right? So we can do this simultaneously so that <laughs> data is already where it needs to be as fast as possible. But we have some other capabilities as well. We can actually create immutable storage if you enable it on the cloud and in Veeam. You can actually create uh, an offsite backup that creates uh, an air gap for you. Because whatever you do, even if you have the keys to the kingdom, when you've made storage immutable for X amount of time, there's nothing that can be done. You just have to wait for the you time. You can't to modify it, you can't delete it. Yeah. Yeah. So you can frustrate even an internal hacker that says, <laughs> Hey, I've logged in, I've logged into your Veeam console or I logged into your cloud yeah. console, I'm gonna delete your backups. No, you can't. It's immutable, so that's an extra piece of capability you get there in this in these times of ransomware. Right? And for some people, this will be very interesting because, well, one, they might already be doing backups to the cloud, uh, but also a lot of people have gotten rid of tapes, and in recent years they are looking at tapes again for their air gap capabilities. Yeah. Uh, there's also some uh, disk vendors offering Worm or VTL vendors offering Worm. Uh, it all depends a bit on how strong that immutability is. And any system where you can easily override it by uh, clicking twice, I confirm, I confirm, uh, I override it, might not be the best idea because somebody has a min access, they can do that as well. But if it's really immutable and you just have to wait for the time to expire, it's a quite interesting concept. Yeah. Uh, so let's, and let's, of course, don't, don't set it to 999 years. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the problem. <laughs> If you, you have to pay for it. <laughs> if you start experimenting with it, uh, Just take it slow, a couple of days to see what's happening. Yeah, and oh, and of course, also make sure that Veeam and the uh, and the uh, the cloud provider are aware of each other, so that you don't make it immutable at the cloud provider, and don't tell Veeam that it's immutable because it might try to delete it uh, files and then things so go the wrong. Immutable storage is now available from Amazon. And uh, Wasabi is an S3 compatible cloud provider that is cost-wise very interesting. He is, I would say, four to five times cheaper than uh, the Amazon storage. They they are focused only on the on the S3 storage, and uh, they don't they don't bill you for the outgress traffic. So if you download a backup, uh, the, uh, if you download something back to your premises. Have to pay a measure in Google, in Amazon, and they don't do that. So in the moment, they they charge you for a terabyte uh, around five dollars a month. And that's quite good price. And the interesting thing is, they just started a data center in Amsterdam. So we have a data center for the storage in Europe. Uh, that's I think it is important that your data is not all in the U.S. Of course, you can encrypt it. But very interesting stuff, and we will maybe talk a little bit later in another showcast about about this. We have to play with it ourselves. Yeah, it, it, it's early days, and I think more and more uh, S3, let's say, 
compatible storage vendors might yeah. start offering integration with backup vendors that offer immutable uh, backups. Yeah. Uh, and of course, this is a release candidate. So we'll see where we where we can take this. Yeah. So, but uh, now let's finish up with this one. Yeah. <laughs> it's done. And we get just a small a small teaser yeah. for the future. Of course, you see these here, the Windows agent backups. So we're also experimenting with protecting the actual physical hosts with Veeam because you can do that. And we've set that up, and that's uh, something we'll uh, talk about in a future video. We will, but we will. Uh, but let let's do this. Let's just go to the cluster. See. You want to see the VM on the cluster? Exactly. That should be there. We, here's our VM. Yeah. We don't have a that checkpoint that's anymore. That's on the hyper yeah. yeah. Now go to the cluster. Then we go to the be cluster. Here. Here's our VM. There it, is. there it is. Yep. There it is. Let's click in here. It's running. At least I hope it's running. <laughs> <laughs> it should. It is one. It is one. It's, it's open somewhere Just else. So do the connect. connect. But then we have to log on. Yeah. It, okay. It's running. Everything is fine. I think that this will conclude our our uh, maybe last uh, Hyper-V video showcast for 2019. Probably. And uh, I hope we we will see you in 2020 again and we wish everybody of you a nice christmas and a happy new year and, lo and lots of nvmes, and lots of the NVMEs yeah. under the christmas tree or even pmem huh yeah well, well. <laughs> why not well, well. okay bye bye did you bye 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 bye, bye, -bye.